coming up on Theater Talk. Where did this play come from, Nikki? I mean, what? I found it, actually. <laughs> yes. In a dumpster. I was in a dumpster outside of Manhattan Theater Club. <laughs> where, I, where I had thrown it. Right. And I said, my God, they're throwing away some perfectly good material. <laughs> theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. What more can I say? How can I express? How confused am I by our happiness? Where do we look? From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and I'm very happy to introduce my substitute co-host for today, Jesse Green, drama critic of New York Magazine. Jesse. Would you please introduce our very special guests? I will. Thank you, Susan. Today we have from Falsettos, the revival on Broadway currently through January 8th, the composer, lyricist, and co-book writer, William Finn. And uh, two of the performers from the show, we have uh, Andrew Rannell. Excellent performance. Pardon me, two of the excellent performers. Uh, one time uh, Mormon, Andrew Rannells. <laughs> yes. Um, and never Mormon, I assume, never. Christian Borle. Don't plan on it either. Okay. <laughs> Two-time Tony winner, Christian oh, Borle. It's nice to be here. <laughs> 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 and several-time Tony winner, Bill Finn. And Two time. best Mormon, I, Andrew Rannells. One-time Tony loser. <laughs> You've done okay, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, yeah please. You. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start with Bill. The revival, where did the idea come to, to bring People it back People have been again? talking about it for years, and the producers always wanted to produce it with... Um, People who couldn't sing it or act it. Such as but big stars? Some, their, their names. Uh, uh, and, and, unlike and, Other big stars, yeah. And others, yes. And, and so until I could find producers who wanted the cast that I wanted, uh, we had to put it off. And finally we did it with Lincoln Center. Were you at all concerned about the... I was concerned about everything. Yes, okay. <laughs> How concerned were you? about the timeliness factor. Let's, let's talk I, a I was, about what the I was actually is. petrified, you know, because so much changed in the gay community, and, and I thought this could be absolutely disastrous and look like, uh, a, a, you know, everything dates. Some things date well, some things don't. Um, it, was, it was lovely to find out this dates incredibly well. But who convinced you, or how were you convinced that it could work? No one convinced me. I, I just felt it was time, time to do it, and I was glad to see, but that doesn't mean I wasn't scared. I, I was, I was totally scared. And when people say, aren't, weren't, "Aren't you thrilled that it's coming back?" I'd say, "Yes," but I'd look quizzical. Let me ask the performers. So both of you were in play pens. I'm the imagining. superb when Perform the superb performers, when the original was set, <clears throat> let alone and when it was produced, you were not yet uh, conscious of theater. I'm imagining you're you're very young. Um, oh, Andrew was. No, yeah, I remember watching the 92 Tonys and seeing the performance, and that's how I became aware of the show. I mean, the... Uh, what about the issues that the show dealt with? Was that something... Uh, were, you, were you living through in any way the tail end uh, of the... Oh, yeah, very much so. I mean, it hit me on a couple levels. I mean, I was already doing, like, you know, community theater in Omaha, Nebraska with men who were living with AIDS. Uh -huh. um, so that factored in very prominently. Also, I was the age that Jason was in the show, mm. which was interesting. Also, being a gay child and, like, thinking, is this my future? Could this be my future? For good and bad, like, does that mean, does being gay mean that I'm going to get sick? Was a question that I had as a kid. I think, you know, learning about the AIDS crisis. Also, you know, I could also be in a very loving relationship with children and so that was also very hopeful to see as a kid so it hit me on many many levels how, how about for you christian Where, would you remember your first encounter? uh i was a freshman in college in 91 and my i'm not my voice teacher gary klein handed me the sheet music to what more can i say oh. and i drove everyone crazy by singing <laughs> that on a weekly basis mm -hmm. and i came to new york in 92 and saw the, saw it on Broadway, and it profoundly moved me. And I was aware of uh, what was happening in the world in as much as I had very progressive parents 
who were properly outraged by how long it took for uh, people to pay attention to what was going on. And as a moderately empathetic person, that was my experience with uh, what was happening politically with the story. When you each came to work on this revival, did you have to do any work in kind of peeling away your modern, your contemporary sensibility about these issues? And did you treat it as a period piece? I personally, there was not one second coming into this experience where I thought whether or not wondered if it would be timely because it's the Bill Finn and James Lapine material is excellent and I can't think of a lot of other shows that were written in another time about another time that came in and had people like I wonder if it will work yeah because it takes place in the no but I, I, understand, I understand why they were asking it, 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 it happens to be excellent but we, we, we weren't assured of that before it happened you know and, and this production Lapine, and it's, it's something I've never seen, he, the, he, he hit a home run in the first production. It was a startling production with everything on wheels, flying across the stage. And, and then, he, then he completely reconceived it, and it's a better production the second time. Love is blind. Which is, it, it never happened. Yes, but did you not think that you were writing about something bigger than just something that happened at a particular time? I certainly did. I certainly did. What was that? What did you th conceptualize it as beyond the facts on the well, ground? Well, I think it's, for me, when I look at the whole thing, it's about being and becoming a man and, and looking at the views of masculinity and everything. I, I think, for me, that, that's what, what the, the whole show, and with Jason's Bar Mitzvah and... And, and the title. And Explain so, the title. Well, when I wrote it, I thought falsettos are outside the normal range, the normal voice range. And I thought this, this family and these characters were outside the normal range. And, and as time has passed, they are no longer outside the normal range. But we still have the characters. And, and I think, you know, the metaphor is, is still strong enough. Christian's character begins the show by, he's left his family, and I mean, I, 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 there's a level on which, although I realize that, you, you, that the character needs to come out, there's a level on which I'm judging him negatively because he's just sort of left everybody. In, mm -hmm. in this way. Well, and he's not painted as the most sympathetic no, character no. either. He is unapologetic he's right out of the gate. Unapologetic right out of the gate. He now, says, I don't mean to offend. Right, but, but there, there... I do think he's saying that for Mendel's sake. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, as, from I'm an actually, analytical standpoint. I actually didn't think so. I think he was saying it... But I'm saying uh, it right to, to him. the audience. Well, that There was, are two moments in the show that, that I've directed. decided to like... Yes, I know. <laughs> but I, this, the way I play it is that he does have a very specific relationship with Mendel. And even saying, I am so dumb, is almost less about like a personal thing of saying like I'm making progress by telling you, my therapist, that I am so dumb. We we but should say that Mendel is the psychiatrist. Psychiatrist, yes. and, and, and eventually marries the wife. Speaking as a child of a broken home, I was kind of mad at him at the beginning. Later on, you feel so terrible. Well, we all have our baggage. You feel so terrible that you you know for what he's gone through that, that you you love him. I think what's fascinating about what they have written is that. You don't necessarily like Marvin, even at the end of Act One. And I've, I've kind of been disciplined about trying to strip away any kind of charm or, or need to I make him that, likable. And that's what's so wonderful. Because he's, it's not necessarily what he's done that I think we judge him on. It's kind of how he, we see him behave. He, he makes incredibly clumsy choices. He's a little petulant. Yes, he is. <laughs> well, it's more than petulance, and it clearly had to have been deliberate. I mean, you, you gave him things to say that are kind of horrible uh, in the first act. And obviously that sets up the life changes that are going to happen to him in the second act. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one of the things I like ab about that is that, particularly at the time when it first came out, th th there was a kind of gay show or th play that was very, uh, I know, sought a lot of sympathy, which is fine, and that, that has its role. But th that character does not really seek any sympathy, and the play doesn't seek any sympathy for gayness per se. Uh, the loss of a lover, that's a different story. But um, having the main gay character be kind of obnoxious and hurtful, sorry. Uh, no, that's absolutely right. Uh, is, is, was, was extremely refreshing in its way back then and, and remains strangely so now. 
But can't you all think of moments in your life when you've been obnoxious and hurtful? And are you still not worthy of kind of love and well, we all, yeah, making yeah. progress? And when you've done stupid, stupid things that you immediately regret, but you can't get them back. But the, but that Bill doesn't present Marvin as all nice and goopy at the beginning gives Correct. us a place to go. Mm -hmm. The right. other thing I want to say about the timeliness is I, 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 you know, I was a young adult during the AIDS crisis here in New York, and I need to be reminded of that. That's what I felt. I, you know, I felt great pain, but, I, you know, I, I need to remember that. Yeah. You know? It was so horrible. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, uh, in playing the part, of course, this character does not know what's going to be happening in the second half, and even mm -hmm. through most of the second half, doesn't know what it is that's happening. Yeah. It uh, takes place in 1981. Uh, at a time when there was no name for this disease. So uh, did you, f was that difficult to do, to kind of, again, strip away your foreknowledge of, of what's going to be happening to this character? Uh, no. I think the roadmap that, that Bill and James sort of presented for us as actors is so, it just makes perfect sense. And it just, I, I mean, it, it didn't really require a lot of extra work to think about how we were, how to connect the dots, which often as actors you have to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. figuring out how we're how we're going to end up there. But with this at all, and I feel it every night that you don't really have to think too far ahead. You just have to be in the scene that you're in. And I'm not saying that as you know to be too actory, but <laughs> but it really there's the process is so alive and is so you just have to be present. And you just do, you know, the second act, the way that the racquetball games are structured and, and even, you know, what more can I say in the, in the middle of those racquetball scenes, it all just allows you to just be in the moment, for lack of a better... They have done all the work. Yeah. And even the way yeah. James Lapine directed it, he didn't uh. want any, any um, he didn't want it to be entertaining. And he truly made, he was very disciplined about stripping away all What's of our... What's an example of, like, how might you have tried to entertain at a certain point? Well, there's, I, I remember a moment in Brandon Uranowitz, who plays Mendel, um, was is singing um, a song to Jason. And there are three musical beats in it. And the impulse is to fill those beats. That's what we kind of, as mm -hmm. actors, and kind of like when we're having fun, we're like, well, I'm going to do, obviously, something on those beats. And James was like, you actually can just stand there. Mm. And it can be awkward. You don't have to fill it. And that's an option. And he did that for the whole show. Yeah. So for the first time in my career that I can think about, I have moments where I'm just standing on stage. Is that scary or liberating? It's incredibly liberating. Very liberating. Uh, just being yeah. instead of acting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you start acting and it's fun again. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's also great the, the pace that he created because there's very little applause in the second act, which is so helpful because I, sometimes on stage when there is, you're holding for applause or you do, it is, feels unnatural and it feels like it does stop the story. So James really allowed us just to sort of plow ahead. And I think it's good for the audience too because they don't have to participate in that way that you yeah. feel like, oh, I guess we have to... Well, in a show that's now. almost entirely sung. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in a way, it, it becomes odder in that circumstance to be stopping the train. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, and I, that makes me wonder whether once you get on at the beginning, whether you feel like, <laughs> I don't know, like I'm on this till the end and whatever happens, happens. And Well, or, yeah, it does sometimes... Uh, Christian and I have to sort of remind ourselves at the beginning that like once it starts... It's just going to go. So sometimes the starting is, is a little intimidating, but then once we're on stage, all of that sort of goes yeah. away. It's, it's so really... shockingly emotional, I think, for everyone in the Walter Kerr. And I've never had the experience as an actor of not having to manipulate anything. The material serves it so beautifully. Mm -hmm. And I do, we had a moment the other night at the beginning of the show where we were kind of about to do four Jews in a room bitching, and I'm dressed in these biblical robes mm -hmm. with this ridiculous yak hair beard. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't <gasps> believe that in two hours and 40 minutes yeah. we have to sing What Would I Do together. Mm -hmm. And it just brings out from my very bowels, this emotion. Like, that's going to happen in two hours and 40 minutes. And you just can't think about it. You just have no. to take it moment by moment, and, and it's so worth it. But w what's strange about that, and, I, and you feel that in the audience as well, uh, is that, of course, these, the first act and the second act were, were written a couple years apart and were kind of cobbled together and 
then redone. And so when you started, you did not have that knowledge that it would be ending there. I did not know where it was going to end, but I always said when I was doing In Trousers, the first part, that it was going to be a trilogy, not knowing how it was going to work out. But just because I'm not so good inventing characters, I thought I have some characters that or seem a little juicy to me, I can work with these people and not have to kill myself inventing new characters, which is what I'm not so good at. Let us name the rest of the people in your wonderful cast. Yes. Brandon Uranowitz, Stephanie J. Block. Stephanie J. Block, unbelievable. Betsy They're Wolf. both. And the boy, yeah. Uh, Brand, uh, yes, Anthony Rosenthal. And, and Betsy Wolf and Betsy Tracy, Tracy Thomas. Thomas. Yeah. Glorious people all. It's an Everyone. amazing truth. Wonderful, troop. wonderful. Falsettos will be running through uh, January 8th. Thank you, Bill Finn, Andrew Rannells, and Christian Borrell. Pleasure yes. for having us. Thank you so much Thank for coming. You. Ask me if I need him. Get him out of my way. These are, these are the games. These are the games. These are the Pose. And so much of it. <laughs> We're only here one night. We can't take it to Acapulco with us. Well, we could, I suppose, but we shouldn't. Is that a kiwi? <laughs> I don't think I've ever had a kiwi before in my entire... <sighs> I have to tell you something. This Day Forward is a funny and ultimately insightful and quite touching play that's now at the Vineyard Theater. It is directed by Mark Brokaw. It stars... Holly Fain, and it's written by our old pal, Nikki Silver. Who I must say is one of the most underrated American playwrights. Nikki Silver has not gotten his due. He should be right up there with Edward Albee oh. for The Menace and Neil Simon for the comedy. I've always thought that about you. It's very, very kind. I lie, but... Uh, <laughs> Drunk out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you were, you were, you've been with us for... What was your first play that well, I Well, the first play that opened in New York was Terry Dackel, so that's 25, 26 years ago. So it's been, a, I, 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 I'm no longer the kid, which is very um, disturbing. I have to ask you, Mark, how many of Nikki's plays have you now directed? Uh, this is my fourth time, third new play. <laughs> you have the lions that went from off-Broadway to Broadway. Yes. Yes. Which, by the way, is a great American play starring the brilliant Linda Lavin and Dick Latessa. That was one of my favorite plays of the last 10 years, The Lions. Oh, shucks. But now <laughs> this one stars the brilliant June Gable and Holly Fain. Now, <laughs> Holly, I want to say this, is, this play involves a marriage. Mm -hmm. And you are the lovely young bride. Mm -hmm. But I will say to Nikki, and you can correct me, Nikki, that I thought you were a kind of a, you know, B word. This is, this is the age of where we're not criticizing women, and I wouldn't use that word. But you, but you're kind of, you're kind of reveal yourself very early in the play to be a nasty, unpleasant selfish. piece of work. Well, <laughs> no, no, but well, was she a nasty, unpleasant piece of work? No, not remote. She's a, she's a, she's a, the most charming, gracious, lovely, demure. We, uh, she is she's all of those things. Now she occasionally she she does something in the play that isn't as kind. Uh, in hindsight, kind as of it selfish. might have been, it's a little <laughs> selfish, but it goes down with a lot of sugar, so to speak, in this instance. Can you give us the setup, though, Nikki? For the I part. have to give the setup. I don't remember it. I don't remember. It. I well, Mark, you know what? I'm going to ask Holly. Holly, tell us about this place. It's the playwright can't remember. <laughs> I don't remember it. It's, I'm, it's uh, new to me every night. Feel free to chime in. Um, well, it starts on the wedding night of Martin and Irene. And um, they've had a lovely wedding. Everything went off without a hitch, and they're back in their hotel room. And Irene has- Don't say. I she, won't. Yeah. But she has, um, a, a, some new information has been brought to light, and she uh, has to share that with her husband. And no audience, she is not a man. <laughs> This is not <laughs> every other play in New York. Identity Week is over. Yeah. <laughs> at the minute, Identity Week. Where did this play come from, Nikki? I mean, what? I found it actually. <laughs> yes. In a dumpster. I was in a dumpster outside of Manhattan Theater Club. <laughs> where, I, where I had thrown it. Right. And I said, "My God, they're throwing away some perfectly good material." So I put my name on the front page and I gave it to Doug Abel. <laughs> Where did it come from? Well, I write generally, I write mostly about families, and this play is sort of a look at 
it's sort of the origin story in a lot of ways, like how these families end up in <laughs> such dire straits. <laughs> I think it is. I, I, I agree. I agree. And and how yes, and because and I said to you when you came into the green room. Now, Nikki, correct me if I'm wrong. Your your family has some tension within it. I said they are delightful charming people and they are it's all my imagination my mother may watch so they are just <laughs> delightful my father is gone but what but was the oh your mother but your mother's alive yeah. <laughs> is she gonna come to <laughs> does she come to see these plays and does she think, yes she what? does come to see them they're not about her she's it's not they're not it's not my mother no, all right. no. linda lavin is not your mother no life. not really she's not like my mother is yeah. nothing like rita I'm dying, Rita. Yeah, I know, but try to be positive. <laughs> My mother is funny, but not like Rita at all. No. Does your mother say, where did you come up with these horrible people thinks, in your place? Um, <laughs> she thinks she sees her mother in them quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she really isn't like Rita. Like, my mother is a, a, a very lively sort of body woman. But if you met my mother in person, and you've met my mother, mm -hmm. she just sort of seems gracious and charming and sweet. Mm -hmm. And my mother is really funny. And my father was really funny. They were both very funny people. But you look forward to Irene's son? Because yes. this play, the first Fans act... 50 years, Fans 50 years. So you look, you look back to her mother which sort of explains some of her behavior. Mm -hmm. And then you fast forward to her son. And so you, you, you show the tensions with the families that create certain situations. And then, and not to sound goopy, sappy goopy. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> you, deal, you deal with the coming to terms and the forgiveness yes. that's necessary. Because most of us, we spend our lives trying to learn to forgive. Yeah. Yeah. For, for uh, people who were, who were doing the best they knew how to do, and one wrong move just revert. People ask me what the place about. I say in one word, race. <laughs> 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 Mark, Mark, what is the greatest challenge of directing race. a Nikki Silver play? We're Getting sitting next to your hair. I was going to ask you, when, 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 you find, when you get the play out of the dumpster, what does a first draft of a Nikki Silver play look like to you? But no, seriously, uh, how quiet am I in the room? Uh, uh, no, truthfully, he is... He's a great <laughs> collaborator in the room because I think he's almost always right. And also because when he started out, he wrote them, he directed them, he built the sets, he cast them, he did the publicity. So I think he really knows what people do in the room. Holly, what's it like working with these two clowns? Oh, it's a dream. <laughs> it's a dream. Yeah. Um, I think they balance each other very well. Because um, they work together for years, so yeah, they have a kind of a rhythm that is, is it difficult to get into what they're talking about because they've been collaborators for so long? No, not at all. I think I think the way they work together is very inclusive. Um, and I've never worked with either of them before. And well, now Holly, you're, like you, you had a stage together. background, but you've been <laughs> yeah. in Los Angeles for a while doing a lot of television. Yeah. You were on Gossip Girls and yes. something very recently, which I should know, and I don't remember. <laughs> 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 How is it that, that they brought you, that they identified you and brought you to be in this play? Because, um, well, yeah. Linda been, Lavin wasn't available. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in Los Angeles for the past six years, but before that I lived in New York. Um, and I love living in LA, but I miss doing things. But how did you find your way to being in this production? I got an, uh, an audition and I put myself on tape from LA, um, talked to Mark on the phone, put myself on tape again, and flew myself out here and auditioned for them in person. Wait, wait, you flew yourself out to audition for this play? Yeah. That's how Yeah. That's how good you thought this play was. Yeah. But you Absolutely. also you had a, you had to return something at Macy's as I recall. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. You were coming anyway. A pair of booties that didn't <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you guys, since you're all people of the theater, because I'm always interested in the moment in your lives where you sort of fell in love with the theater, Mark. Uh, you know, I didn't grow up uh, I grew up in a part of Illinois where there wasn't any theater. At all. So I think it was probably watching something like The Carol Burnett Show, hmm. The Variety Hour. Hmm. That was it? Mm -hmm. And you understood there was something about the performance there, the energy there? The yeah, yeah, very much so. And also because it was filmed in front of a live audience, so there was that interaction. And Holly, for you? I, I'm, I was very shy growing up, and I, but there was something about plays and school theater, and I decided to audition in seventh grade for, for the what school show? play, Anne of Green Gables. Um, and surprisingly, I got the part of Anne and it kind of changed my life. I, I found myself talking more in class and just feeling better about myself and just thought it was magical and kept on doing it through high school and college. And 
And you, Nikki, when you, you were a handsome young man growing up? Well, that was not the case. <laughs> uh, I thought theater was like arsenic and old lace, and I liked it and everything, but I know, I know the answer to this because I've thought about it before. When I was 11, I know, my father brought me to New... He used to bring me to New York for the weekend, and we would see plays, and it was seeing um, Anthony Hopkins and Peter Firth in Equus. So I was coming to New York and seeing very sophisticated things uh, very early in my childhood. Because we went to see, like, your, you know, the Fantastics, and I, it was a little dull for me. I like nudity and wire sculpture horses. All right, I still have a sort of fetish for wire sculptures. Not the horses, but the sculptures I like. Thank you so much, Nikki Silver. From this day and forward, the wonderful at Holly the Vineyard Mark Theater. Rocco. No, I'm going to get there. And no. June Gable and Michael Crane and Joe Tippett and Andrew Burnap and is that everybody? Frankie Farrell and Frankie Frankie. Okay, Holly Fane, Mark Brokaw, Mark Brokaw, and Nikki Silver. And let me Thank just you. again say, Nikki Silver is one of the most underrated American playwrights. <laughs> so go out and buy the collected works of Nikki Silver. You can find them at the Strand. <laughs> <laughs> In the, in the dumpster outside of the drama <laughs> bookshop where they throw the remainder. <laughs> and Frankie, Frankie, how do you say her name? Veridani. I call her Frankie. Yeah. All five we of them. We all call her Frankie. All six of them. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Frankie. Good work. <laughs> we'll see you at the Vineyard Theater. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.